day the Lord has made. We should rejoice and be glad in it. So you might be looking around and you're saying, what is going on at Robertson Avenue? As you know, tonight we begin our Vacation Bible School. And so we are looking forward to that. If you are looking for a place to bring your children for Vacation Bible School, we want you to bring them to Robertson Avenue Baptist Church. We're going to actually have a meal around 4, 4.15. And so you are invited to come and be a part of that. All right, church. I uh, also have been asked to give you this announcement. Uh, for those of you that have volunteered for Vacation Bible School, those of you that are working in it, we need to meet back here this afternoon at 3 o'clock. So we'll meet here in the sanctuary, and we'll be sent out with our various tasks from there. So 3 o'clock today. All right. So good morning, and welcome to Robinson Avenue. If you're a visitor with us, we want to say a special welcome to you. Ask you to take the time to fill out the little visitor card you'll find in front of you. Place it often place it to come around so we can have a break of your visit. We would greatly appreciate that. And if you're watching online and visiting for the first time, we want to say welcome to you as well. I want you to know that we're praying for you and asking God to bring you here to see us in person. All right. So what's happening in Robinson Avenue? As you already know, Vacation Bible School kicks off this evening. So come and be a part of that. But that's not all we're doing at Robinson Avenue. Uh, youth camp start out June the 20... What was that date? June, June the 27th. Uh, youth camps will start out there. So with our preteen camps and our, our first youth camps starting out there. So for more information, you can get with Sister Amber Wiseman on that. Also, church, I want to remind you that in the foyer, we still have a few baby bottles to give out. Those baby bottles go to support our Hope Pregnancy. Uh, it's one of our sister ministries here in Copper Stove. And what that ministry does, it supports those ladies who find themselves in a situation where they are scared and they don't know where to go or what to do. Some of them are considering abortion. And so Hope Pregnancy provides an alternative to that scary end. And so please prayerfully consider being a part of that. If you'll take one of those uh, baby bottles, fill it up with your spare change, you'll find out your change will change somebody's life. And so that helps fund um, things like... Um, ultrasounds and things with prenatal care and sometimes some gifts and clothing and uh, maternity wear for those young ladies. So please carefully consider being a part of that. I understand it's one of the most evangelistic ministries you could be in. I understand there is a lot of salvation that come through hope pregnancy. So please carefully consider being a part of that. Uh, we will be observing that offering until Father's Day, June the 20th. That will be the last day to turn your bottles in. If you've already taken one and filled it up, Bring it back. Give it to my secretary, Monica. We'll lock it up for you and give you another bottle. Fill it up and bring it back with you on the 20th. So if you still have one, the 20th is the last day. So if you'll bring them back in by that Sunday, we would greatly appreciate that. Uh, one more thing about Vacation Bible School. I've also been asked uh, when the service is over, and I'll do my best to remind you. Uh, if you would, pass your hymnal to us uh, very front. We put them down in the middle so we can clean them out for Vacation Bible School hymnals, the envelopes, the ink pens, and all the things in the pockets so that we can get those out for Vacation Bible School. We would appreciate your help and cooperation in that as well. All right. With that being said, <laughs> coming up June the 13th, we will have our ministry meeting at 4 p.m. And uh, I think that's going to be about, you know, oh, well, sorry about that, uh, June 21st. So we're having uh, the sound booth redesigning. So we're going to be tearing it down and rebuilding it in the back, a sound booth. So you get the CD burrows about that. And we'll uh, get you plugged in if you're interested in helping in that. There's a lot of things going on at Robson Avenue, and we want you to come and be a part of that. All right. Come on up, Sister Ann.
Thank you, Sister Ann. So for those of you that decorated the church, I want to say God bless you. Thank you for that. It looks fantastic, doesn't it? <laughs> it brought great joy to my heart when I opened up the door and I was met by a monkey. Amen. <laughs> it was something. So I come up behind the pulpit and I found this Buccaneer Bay. And, of course, there was no shortage of jokes about, well, Pastor, you're the monkey behind the pulpit now. And so just all kinds of things. But anyway, if you'd be in prayer for those guys, I would appreciate it. I want to remind you all that uh, June 13th is Betsy and my 23rd wedding anniversary. So please be in prayer for Betsy. Uh, <laughs> same time, we're also going to have our Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. And so if you know some of our cops, let me tell you, it's a hard time to be a police officer. Please be in prayer for them. Invite them to Robertson Avenue. Let them know we're going to be appreciating them. And we're going to be praying for them. I believe we have plans to set up a day of prayer in the parking lot here for our law enforcement. I think it's going to be on June 6th. So maybe tomorrow, if not, uh, be Sabbath, um, excuse me, Tuesday the 7th. So please be in prayer for that. Prayerfully consider being a part of that, praying for our law enforcement. Uh, they really need it, y'all, and they're hurting. And they, uh, you know what, speaking to some of them, they feel betrayed by a community they served and protected for so many years. So please be in prayer for our law enforcement. And it's a wonderful opportunity to bring Jesus Christ to a lot of people who do not know Jesus Christ. So uh, let's keep those things in mind as well. With that being said, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And after we pray, we're going to turn this service over to Brother Robert. Father, we come to you now in Jesus' name. We want to thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to gather together this morning in your house. And I'm just praying, Lord, you reach out and touch us. Fill us with your spirit today and help us, Father God. Help us to worship you in truth and spirit. I'm just praying, Lord, you speak to us. That you'd open our ears, Lord, so we'd be in tune to hear from you. That whatever you might have to say, whatever you want to reveal to us, Lord, would not pass us by. Instead today, Lord, that we would respond when we hear the prodding of your spirit. When we feel you, Lord, that we would get up and come to you. I'm also praying, Lord, if there be anybody here this morning that needs to come to know you as personal Lord and Savior, would you let today be that day? I'm also praying, Father God, if there be any here this morning that are hurting, any, Father God, that need to come to you in any way, any form, any fashion, would you let today be the day they finally surrender and come to you? I want to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory, and ask you to go with us, even now, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. So, Robert.
over all these wives here. Well, if you have your Bibles with you, turn to please to the book of Exodus, chapter 3, Exodus, chapter 3. our series from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We started last week looking at Abraham, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that would reasonably conclude that we would look at Isaac today. And of course, next week, at Jacob. Amen? So, if you have your Bibles with you, tell me to please the book of Exodus, chapter 3. Let's read verses 1 through 6. The Bible says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Shall we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, we come to you now in Jesus' name. We want to thank you, Lord, for your word. And I pray, Lord, your word would move into our hearts and to our lives right now. And if there be anyone who needs to come to know you as personal Lord and Savior, we ask that you that day. If there be anyone, Father, that needs to become a part of Robertson Avenue Baptist Church, if there be anyone, Father, that needs to surrender to you in any way, to repent and get their life right, would you let them be that day? Give you the praise, the honor, and glory in Jesus' name. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The title of this morning's message, part two. Of course, we'll conclude next week with part three. And I hope you're enjoying it as much as I have. Of course, what kind of sermon could this be if we didn't go into a little bit of what we did last week? So let's focus in on our forefathers real quick. Before we do that, something really interesting stood out to me, and I want to bring it out to you real quick. If you'll look back in your Exodus chapter 3, where Moses answered God. Now, last week, we spent some time talking about how God called out to Moses, and he said, Moshe, Moshe, and we talked about how God has to tell men twice things. You can back that up scripturally. But every man that God speaks to, he always calls a name twice. But Moses answers God in a very amazing way, in a Hebrew phrase that we don't often see. He says, here am I. If you have a modern day version, it might say, here I am. If you have an old King James, it'll say, it'll say something like this. Here I am, here am I. Anything that would make a little less sense to us in today's language. But the word that's used there is hanini. Hanini in Hebrew. And it's a very wonderful phrase. It means literally, here I am, but it means I'm ready to do what you want done. It's kind of like, uh, whatever you want done, I'm ready to do. It's, it's basically like saying, your wish is my command. I need me. In fact, you see it throughout the Old Testament when Abraham speaks to his son in Genesis 22. Uh, and he says, here, my son. And of course, Isaac looks up at Abraham and says, I see my father's the wood, I see the knife, but where is the lamb? And of course, they always respond to each other with, Hanini, here I am. When Joseph is sent to Shechem to go check on his brothers, Jacob calls Joseph, and how does Joseph answer? Hanini, it's a term of endearment. And we see Moses answering God in a term of endearment. Here I am, whatever you're wishing, whatever you want done, I'm ready to do it. And I can't help but bring that out this morning as I think about the church today, how we've forgotten what it's like to answer God with a completely devoted heart that says, whatever you want done, I'm going to do it. I think sometimes the church has forgotten that we are here to serve Him, not just worship Him. There are times that we've forgotten that He is holy, He is righteous, he is true, and that when He speaks, we should answer, and me, your wish is my command. Your wish is my will, literally. Whatever you want done, I'm already going to do it. I want to be that close to you. Not just here I am, but I want to be right next to you to the point where whatever you're thinking, I already know. And so you see the picture in the New Testament of John laying his head on the breast of Jesus. What he's 
saying is that neatness. Can you imagine what that would be like to be able to feel the heartbeat of God? To hear his heart beating under his breath. And I know what John was feeling. And I know how John must have fought that night at that last supper. As he felt the heartbeat of Jesus Christ. That heart was beating for the lost. I loved him, John. Go get them, John. For God so loved the world, John, that he gave his only begotten son, that if they will just believe, John, he heard the heartbeat. Do you hear the heartbeat? And will you answer how to do this morning? Well, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the title of this morning's message. So let's focus in on our forefathers this morning. Let's look at Isaac. His name is Hitzok in Hebrew, and literally what it means is laughter. In fact, he's named laughter because a situation arises where God shows up and tells tells Abraham, you're going to have a son. Your wife, Sarah, is going to have a son. And the Bible tells us that she is behind the tent listening in and laughs. And God confronts her and says, why did you laugh? And she tells a whopper, doesn't she? She said, I didn't laugh. He said, oh, but you did laugh. And, of course, when the son is born, they name him Hitzach, which means laughter. So we are looking this morning at I am the God of Isaac, the God of laughter, if you will. And let me tell you right now, God loves it when his children laugh. Amen? He loves it because a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. And if you find yourself hurting, I want you to know right now you can find joy again in the Word of God. So let's remember Abraham a little bit this morning. Remember we talked about him last week, how we wanted to be uh, like Abraham. He was uh, the first one God mentioned in it. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham was a star. He shone like a star. Remember, his descendants were stars. He also had descendants like sand, and we need to get a little gritty like sand sometimes. And the church has lost its grittiness, hasn't it? We give away to anything. You want to talk about losing our grit? We've given grit. We've given everything away. We've allowed homosexuals to have an agenda in our public school system, and the children of God are checked out. Why? Because we're not gritty anymore. We've lost our sandiness. We've lost our ability to be abrasive. We've lost our ability to stay put. We've lost our ability to not get swept out. And we talked about that sand before. How many times have you went through and swept the sand up, vacuumed it up, just to find more sand later on? I think they're like the gremlins sometimes. If you feed them after midnight or get them wet, they reproduce, don't they? Christians are supposed to be the same way. If they get fed, they're supposed to reproduce. If they get wet, they're supposed to reproduce. We're supposed to be sandy like that. Well, this morning we're going to look in at Isaac. So... Isaac is one of our most interesting characters. Though there's not a lot about him. Of course, there's a little bit, but not as much as Abraham or Jacob. Most people like to focus in on Abraham. Why? Because he was the father of our faith. Right? We like looking at Jacob because he's the father of the twelve patriarchs. But very little is said about Isaac in comparison, even though a lot is actually said. I have a wonderful picture I'd like for you to see. This is Isaac and Rebecca. This is when uh, Rebecca is coming back to that traveling in the desert. And the Bible tells us in Genesis 24 that she lights off of her camel or her donkey. And she comes to meet the man walking through her. And she covers her face in a veil. And I thought tastefully the picture was done cutting her face off like her veil would have cut her face off there covering her eyes. So we have Isaac and Rebecca here. So what is Isaac known for? Literally and honestly, if you were asked this morning to tell me a little bit about Isaac, what would you say? You say, well, Pastor, I know what his name means now. It means laughter. Amen. That means you were listening. Amen. So what is he known for? Well, he's known for loyalty. He's known for fierce loyalty. He was loyal to his father's tradition. He was loyal to his father's house. He was loyal to what his dad was doing. And he upkept his father's works. And that's a beautiful thing. And I think the church needs a good old-fashioned baptism of loyalty again. We've forgotten to be loyal to what our fathers were doing. What were our fathers doing? Well, they were evangelizing. They were missionizing. They were witnessing. They were reaching out with the gospel. If you were to look inside of the church today and just be honest with yourself, when's the last time you witnessed personally to somebody? There was a survey taken by Christianity Today ten years ago, and ten years ago, less than one percent of modern-day Christians witness or share their faith at all. 
that we've lost that sanity, if we've lost that loyalty. Isaac was known for his loyalty. He was also known for reverence. He revered God. He did. He revered God in a holy way. He wasn't just reverential out of respect. No, no, no. He feared God. We're going to meet somebody in the Bible that actually talks about the fear of Isaac. Endurance. He was known for endurance. Remember that whole sacrifice thing he rose up on a mountain for? Abraham's going to sacrifice him, and yet he keeps on keeping on. He stays in that relationship with this God who did not understand at that time. He's also known for being the husband of Rebecca. Rebecca was a famous person as well. He's also the father of Eshua, Esau, and Yaakov, and Jacob. And of course, a personal favorite one is that whole blessing scandal at the end of Isaac's life, you know? Where something happened there between Esau and Jacob. And we're going to look at that this morning. Praise God, right? We're going to do it quick because I'm already running out of time. So we're looking at the God of Isaac this morning, and we're focusing in on Isaac. Why would God describe himself as, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, unless he wants us to be like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? So what can we learn from Isaac this morning? How can we put Isaac's life into focus in our lives, to start putting it together in our lives, to start using what he did, learning from what he did in our lives? Let's focus in this morning on Isaac and see what made him so remarkable. So turn with me, please, in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 21. I know we're going to do a little bit of reading, but we're actually going somewhere. Genesis chapter 21, verses 8 to 10. Remember, Isaac had his brother. His brother's name was Ishmael, and they, of course, were rivals. Why were they rivals? Because Ishmael was born first, but he was not born of Abraham's actual wife. He was born of Abraham's concubine meaning that Ishmael had little or no inheritance. He had no authority unless his father went ahead and made him the heir, which was unlikely, but that was his hope, obviously, because when Isaac is born, something happens here. Let's take a look here in verse 8. So the child grew, that would be Isaac, and was weaned. That means he is left breastfeeding from his mother. And in Hebrew times in these days, they would then turn that child over to the father. Guys, we need to praise God. We don't do that anymore because she quit changing diapers after the weaning. That means it was all dad's job. That's right. You need to start thanking God. We live in 2021. Amen? Hallelujah. Lord, set us free. So the child grew and was weaned. She turned him over to his father, and there was a celebration made about that. There was a feast made about it, his weaning. So look with me in verse 8 again. Abraham made a great feast. On the same day that Hitzhak was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, and that was the name of, of Abraham's concubine. She's an Egyptian Hagar. Uh, in fact, later on, we'll actually start calling the Egyptians the Hagarines. And you can see where that comes from right there in your Bible, in the Chronicles, and in the Kings, and in the First and Second Samuel. You'll see some reference to the Egyptians as the Hagarines. So we have this Egyptian named Hagar, who Abraham more than likely picked up when he went down into Egypt when there was a famine in the land, if you're familiar with Genesis chapter 12. He comes back, and out of a sudden, Hagar is part of his family and part of his life. It was probably one of the uh, dowry gifts that was given to Abraham by Pharaoh as he tried to take Sarah as his wife or as his own concubine. But he pays Abraham. Remember, Abraham tells everybody, she's my brother. And, of course... Uh, Pharaoh takes it, and God intervenes, and then he gives a lesson in morals to Abraham. Seriously, honestly. So anyways, uh, we have this son of Hagar. His name is uh, Ishmael. So look in verse 9. Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, scoffing. And so literally what you need to understand here is he's laughing. He's laughing. He's laughing at little laughter. It, it's a Hebrew play on words, and it's supposed to be funny. It's supposed to act with a smile on your face. He's Hitzhaking Hitzhak. That's exactly what's happening here. Therefore she said to Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. In other words, she comes across Ishmael making fun of, laughing in a bad way at his little half-brother Isaac. And literally, you can take from what's written in here is this kind of tone. You think you're going to inherit from our father Abraham? 
little bitty Isaac? Well, I want you to know that Abraham's a little too old to stop what's going to happen because he's going to die any day now, and you're a little too small to stop me from inheriting. Of course, Mama overhears that, and she immediately goes to Abraham and says, Get rid of this kid. And of course, Abraham, as you know, the rest of the story is extremely sad. He's upset, and he goes to God about it. So we have Isaac and his brother here. Isaac is born with rivalry. He's born with rivalry in his life. And you might be sitting there this morning thinking, I'm constantly competing, Pastor. I'm competing in the rat race at my job. I'm competing at work. I'm competing with people all around me. You might be thinking, I'm trying to find someone to date. I want to find a man to marry. I want to find a woman to marry. And I'm constantly competing with somebody. You might be sitting in the pews this morning saying, Pastor Joshua, I'm competing with fellow Christians about how to become the next Sunday school teacher. Or I'm constantly competing with them about who knows more about the Bible. And I feel like I'm constantly in a competition. I want you to know that you can learn something from Isaac this morning as Isaac trusted in the grace of his father. That's what you need to do this morning. Sitting in the pews, you need to start trusting in the grace of God Almighty. You need to turn it over to God saying, I don't care what Ishmael is doing. You're going to make me laugh because you love me. Isaac, born in controversy. Isaac, born in competition. Isaac constantly had to worry about Ishmael putting a knife in his back. Could you imagine what it meant when little Isaac was born? Ishmael's plan, his dream, his conquest, his entire status in life changed when Isaac was born. And all of that could come right back with the death of the little fur ball. Think about that. Isaac was born like that. Born in that controversy. Yet he's quiet. He's humble. He's meek. He's mild. You know what the Bible says about humble people? The Bible says if you will humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, He will lift you up. Amen? Isaac was born in that controversy. And you might be sitting there this morning and saying, I'm tired of competing. Quit competing. Start trusting in God Almighty. The Bible says in Proverbs 3 and verse 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your path in everything you do. Stop competing. Start trusting. Learn from Isaac this morning. Are you competing? Are you worried about what someone thinks about you? Be an Isaac this morning and start laughing. Amen? Let me tell you, I'd rather laugh than get into an argument with somebody nowadays. Don't do that with your wife, though, guys. If your wife wants to have a row with you, do not laugh in her face. You're going to make things worse. But if somebody you're competing with wants to have words with you, little laugh, turn around and walk off and put it in God's hands. Because I promise you, if you're in the right, God will deliver you. You know what else Isaac was? Isaac was a sacrifice as well. Look with me in Genesis 22. I thought he was going to jump around a little bit. Genesis 22. So right now you can turn, turn around and see Isaac was born in controversy. Isaac was born in competition, and he didn't worry about the stress. He didn't worry about the pressure. He didn't worry about any of that. He let God the Father handle it. He let his father Abraham handle it. And you need to let God Almighty handle yours. Put it in his hands and let Father God take care of it. Isaac was also a sacrifice. This will be in Genesis 22, verses 1 through 5. The Bible says, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, guess what? I mean me. <laughs> Here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Hitzach. Now, this is a few years after Ishmael has been, been kicked out of the house and his mom, uh, Hagar. You notice how God words this. It's not take your other son. It's not take one of your sons. It's take your only son. Because I can guarantee you, if God said, take one of your sons, who do you think Abraham would have went out to fight? That's right, Ishmael. He said, take your son, your only son, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah. Now, you know the story. You know that Mount Moriah is Mount Calvary. You know why it takes three days to get there. You know why he carries the wood up. And you know the story and the similarities and the pictures of Jesus that's in this. We're not going to go into that. 
If you're Jewish, this is called the binding of Isaac or the oxen. But take a look with me here in verse 2. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. Offer him there as a burnt offering. And the word that's used here, we don't often see, is holocaust. Offer him there as a burnt offering. And the next time you think of our Jewish brothers and sisters in the Holocaust, understand what they're saying. We were the burnt offering. Offer him there as a burnt offering, as a Holocaust. On one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning. A church, the Bible tells us, is saddled his donkey. He took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering. And he arose and he went to the place which God had told him. And verse 4 tells us on the third day. Of course it was the third day. Abraham lifted his eyes and he saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, the lad, and I will go yonder and worship. You stay with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. And we will come back to you. What's happening here? Of course, you know the rest of the story. There's a wonderful dialogue between son and father as the son looks up and says, Daddy! And it's not its not a, a, a term of endearment there. It's a term of surprise. Father, Abba, Papa, why are we going upon this mountain without the offering? And that's when, of course, Abraham utters those famous words. My son, God himself, will provide the lamb for the offering. And now you know the rest of the story. As John the baptizer stands there that fateful morning, and Jesus comes out, and John hollers out, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. What's he talking about? That promised Lamb. So many years ago. The Bible tells us a dialogue with sheep. Eventually they get to the top where Abraham finds his son. There is debate on how old his son is. Some people say 13. The rabbis say 33. <laughs> I'm not getting that. 33. Either way, Abraham's well over 100 years old. Who could have stopped this at any time they wanted to? I could have said, no, that's not going to happen to me. He could have outran his old father. He could have outpowered his old father. But instead, he submitted. We need to be a little more Isaac-like in our lives. If Isaac can handle pressure, if Isaac can handle competition by turn it, putting it in his father's hand, then Isaac also learned that I can handle any sacrifice, I can handle any cutting, I can handle anything in my life if I will just trust my father, if I will just believe what he said. Because what did Abraham say to his son? He said, my son, God himself will provide a lamb. And that's all he needed to know. He had let his father tie him up. He laid down on that altar. His father raised the knife up and he was ready to die. Why? Because he believed to the very last minute that God would provide a lamb. We need to be Isaacs in our lives today. We need to believe that no matter how bad things look, no matter how scary things are looking, no matter how close to the end it's getting, God still has the answer. Amen? Think about that for a second. You are competing. You are wondering, how am I going to handle it? Put it in God's hand. You're sitting there saying, I think things couldn't get any worse. You don't have it as bad as Isaac did. I promise you, that guy was standing there with a knife, getting ready to slay his son. And Isaac took it like a man, for lack of a better way to say it. He took it like a Christian. I will willingly do the will of my father. What a beautiful Christian picture. He took it like a man of God. He took it like a woman of God. He said, I will submit. Getting back on Abraham, though, he tells his servant, I love this in verse 5. You guys stay here with the donkey. Me and the boy are going to go and worship. And we will come back to you. Now, we've got all kinds of sermons on Abraham's faith on that particular verse right there. Me and the boy will come back. There's been all kinds of speculation, all kinds of sermons saying Abraham had no doubt that he would bring his boy back. And I believe those are 100% true. But I think sometimes we miss the obvious. See, he left those two men with the donkey. 
He left them with the donkey. And you might be standing there in your life today saying, I'm hanging around with a bunch of donkeys in my life, don't you? You know what you need to do? You need to take a picture out of this. And you go to worship, you go to church, and leave the dumb donkeys behind in your life. Amen? <laughs> no wonder they named him Isaac. Amen? You might need to leave some dumb donkeys behind. They've been dragging you to bars. They've been dragging you to drugs. They've been dragging you to pornography. They've been dragging you to alcoholism, to, to tobacco, and to spousal abuse. They've been trying to tell you it's okay when the Word of God says it's not okay. It's time for you to get up, go to church, and leave the dumb donkey behind. Isaac, born in all kinds of pressure, born in conflict, he put it in God's hand born as a sacrifice. And he said, I believe my father is capable of anything. If he says we're coming back, I'm coming back. It doesn't matter if he stabs me, if he cuts my throat. It doesn't matter if I'm burned as a holocaust. I'm coming back because my father said so. We need that kind of faith. What else is Isaac known for? Isaac is known for his wonderful wife, Rebecca. Take a look at this picture I have here for you. There she is right there, a little cartoony, I know. This time she gets up off and she's got her face covered with the veil. And that's Isaac right there to your, I guess would be to your right. Isaac right there, the camels are down there. And we don't really know who the most trusted servant is. I put my money on Eliezer. And most scholars do, and I agree with that right there. So he brings her back. And this is the first time they're meeting. Well, Isaac does have a wonderful wife, Rebecca. She's so wonderful, she ends up with a favorite son. Take a look with me in Genesis 25, verses 19 through 22. Let's look a little bit at Isaac's wife and the relationship he has with his wife. Genesis 25, 19 to 22. The Bible tells us this is one of those famous Hebrew phrases here. And if you're a counselor, you'll know that there are ten holy notes you need to be aware of in your Bible. Verse 19 here, Genesis 25, is one of those. This is the totally dope. This is the general genealogy of Esau, of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padam Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. What a man of faith. The Bible tells us that Rebekah was barren. And so Isaac, instead of complaining, instead of crying, instead of going out trying to find some miracle cure, he got on his knees, he called out to his father in heaven and prayed to him. And the Bible simply says, God granted his plea. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Now look at me in verse 42. What inside of her, the children struggled together. Let me tell you something God always does above and beyond what we ask him. Amen? As far as I know, Isaac was only asking for one kid. Instead, he gets two. Now, if he was a man of 2021, he'd be complaining and say, Lord, I don't have enough money to feed both of them. Well, not Isaac. He's a great man. He takes them both and is happy with it. Look with me in verse 22. The children struggled together within her. He was still in the conflict inside of her. And she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Now, this is a beautiful statement because you don't see this often in the Bible. Usually you see the man doing that, don't you? Now we have Rebecca doing it. How do you say her name in Hebrew? Rebecca. What does it mean? Well, you can look it up. You really should. It's a powerful, powerful name. Rebecca goes and inquires of the Lord. And God speaks to her. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Remember back in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3? God spoke to Adam, but he did not speak to Eve. In fact, it was Adam's job to tell Eve whatever God said. Remember? Now we have God speaking to the woman. I want you to know something, ladies. This sermon isn't just for men. It's for you as well. You might be sitting there saying, I'm in conflict with your pastor. When are you going to preach to me? You need to start being a Rebecca. You need to start going to the Lord about the problems in your life. You need to start talking to Jesus about what's happening in your heart. You need to start talking to Jesus about what's going on in your marriage. Do you want an Isaac-like husband? Then start playing for him. Amen? Do you want a man who's faithful, who's loyal? Do you want a man who will be there with you? Then my goodness, grab him, take him to church, and help him leave those dumb donkeys behind. But to 
the children struggled inside of her, and she went to the Lord. And listen to what God said. Two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Many of you are Bible scholars here, and you know where we got a reference here to Jacob and Esau. Esau, of course, is the older, but just by a minute, if that second, really. And, of course, Jacob comes out, and he grabs a hold of Esau's heel, and that's what gets him his name. And what does Jacob mean? Heel grasper, or heel supplanter, or literally, wise guy, someone who trips you up. That's what Jacob means. Have you ever met somebody named Jacob? That's what they do. They trip you up. Amen? All right. So we have two nations in Rebekah's womb. We have Esau, which turns out to be Edom. Later on, Edom. Edom produces a lot of kings and a lot of dukes and a lot of problems for Israel later on. And, of course, Jacob produces the 12 tribes of Israel. And I have a wonderful picture here for you I'd like for you to see. And let's take a look at that for just a second. You have Rebecca giving birth in a very old-fashioned way, probably not the way the Hebrews did it. This is more the way the middle-aged English people would have done it. And I'm telling you right now, the way they're doing it right there, I'd probably be screaming out in pain, too. Look at her face. That woman's hurting. Midwives are all around, and, of course, they're giving out twins, and Esau has come out, and he's in the lady's arms, and Jacob's coming out, and he reaches up, and he grabs a hold of Esau's heel. That's how he gets that name, Yaakov means heel that Someone that trips you as you're running. Someone who trips you. Isaac. As you can see, he was the father of competition. He was somebody who was born in competition with his brother Ishmael. He was born to be a sacrifice. And he didn't have any problem believing God's word, believing his father's word. And you know what? We should have that kind of mindset right now. You're in competition in the world. You know you're in competition with the devil everywhere you go. Do you know you're in competition with spirits everywhere you go? And you need to be an Isaac. And you need to say, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. You need to be an Isaac. Is God going to use you in a place where you may have to suffer? So be it. Because what God says is far better and far greater than what this world has to offer. All right, take a look at Isaac here. The father of competition. How many of you know this particular true statement? This is not from the Bible. It's just true. Tough times produce strong men. Did you know that? It most certainly does. Tough times produce strong men. Strong men produce peaceful times. Peaceful times produce, guess what? Weak men. And weak men produce, guess what? Tough times. And we have this circle that's going around. If you were to place the church in that circle, where do you think it would be right now? Some of you may disagree with me, but I think we're right during that peaceful time here in the United States as a church today. We're in peaceful time. We have never faced a true persecution. We've never faced any true trials or tribulations. The worst trials, tribulations, persecutions we've ever had was someone saying, you hurt my feelings. I'm not coming to your church because you don't have air conditioner. I'm not coming to your church because you didn't have a good BBS. I'm not coming to your church because your music wasn't good. I'm not coming to your church because your preacher's too loud. Somebody once told me that. And I was like, wait till you get to heaven. Never read about what heaven's like? Everything's a loud trumpet. Incidentally, I read the Ten Commandments, and I read them all the time. And how many of you know this is true? There is no eleventh commandment that says, thou shalt not shout. Isaac. Isaac was one of my favorite guys in the Bible. If we were to compare the church to him today, we would be right in those peaceful times producing weak preachers, producing weak Christians, producing weak witnesses, weak ministers who give in to any trials, any tribulations, any persecution. We're no longer sandy. We're no longer starry. We're no longer what God has called us to be. Instead, we just take whatever the world has given to us and we allow the world to conquer us. When Jesus said, I promise you, the gates of hell will never prevail against my church. So we're producing weak men of God. So what really defines Isaac? The Bible tells us as Jacob is described as his father. This is when he's hanging out with his uncle Laban. He's trying to marry his soon-to-be wife Rachel and Leah. Of course, her name is Amelia, both of them. 
And he's actually describing the situation to his uncle Laban. Look with me in Genesis 31, verse 42. The Bible says, Unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the seer of Isaac, Unless the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely now, Laban, you would have sent me away empty-handed. Surely you would have. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. What is the fear of Isaac? What is the fear of Isaac? Well, let me talk a little bit about fear. I know I'm running out of time here. But let's talk a little bit about fear. Isaac was a good dad. He was. And his children feared him in a reverential way. They feared him. They knew the lines they could cross. They knew what they could get away with. They knew what Dad would find out about, and they knew what Dad wouldn't find out about. Why? Because Isaac was a good father. Isaac was also a good husband. You know how I know he was a good husband? Because he let his wife have a relationship with God. Amen? That's how she could go and talk to God. And Isaac did not even intervene. That's a man of faith right there. He trusted in his relationship with God so much that her relationship with God did not become a threat to him. How many husbands sit there and say, you can't know more about God than I do. You better not talk to my wife. My wife knows more about God. My wife knows more about anything than I do. It's true. The fear of Isaac. He was a good husband. Isaac said, well, of course, was a reverent man. And fear has its context all in itself. It has it in there. His children were afraid of him. They knew what they could do and what they couldn't do. And they knew what would bring about the punishment from their father. Did you know today in society we have children that have no fear of authority? Do you know why that is? Do you know why that is? Because truthful times produce weak men. Peaceful times in the church produce weak Christians. And you know what's happening right now? As we turn around and say, you can't be mad at my kid. He only stole. Absolutely. You can't judge him for that. He's on his 93rd marriage. How dare you judge him? You're not better than he is. You're right. I'm not. I'm just more reverent. Isaac was a good dad. His children were afraid of crossing that line that would bring punishment. Isaac was a good husband, and he allowed his wife, he encouraged his wife to develop a relationship with God the Father. And she went to him, and God spoke to her. That, to me, is amazing. And Isaac was a reverent man. Fear, the Bible says. Let's take a look at fear. Remember what Jacob says to Laban? Unless the fear of Isaac had been with me. Remember, Jacob is one of Isaac's children. And what he's telling Laban is, unless you knew my father would bring his army down here and squash you like a little ant for mistreating me, that's what kept you from doing the things that you've done. The fear of Isaac, because my dad's a good man. We need dads like that in the church today, don't we? We need fathers who will stand up for their children. We need fathers who can grab a hold and say, I'm responsible for that kid to the day I die. I don't ever want to give up on my children. My children are there and they're mine until the day God takes me home. And then I have enough faith to know they're God's children after that. Look with me in Proverbs 1 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. You want to begin understanding? You want to begin getting smart? You really want some wisdom? You want some knowledge? Start in the fear of the Lord. What does that mean, Josh? Do I need to respect him? No, 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 no. This fear is terror. Terrified to break God's command. Terrified to sin against him. And the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You want to learn something? Start understanding that when you sin, you store up wrath against you on the day of judgment. Look at Job 28, verse 28. And to man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Want to do some more on fear? Look here with me in fear. Isaiah 33, verse 6. I love this one right here. Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your time and the strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. That is your treasure, Christian. I don't 
the same can help you. The fear of the Lord is your treasure. I will not sin against God because I know what God does. Now, have you ever read the Bible? Do you know why good godly men can't commit adultery? Because they've read what happens to adultery. Do you want to know why good godly men refuse to lie? Because they read what happens to liars. Do you know why good godly men refuse to steal? Because they read what happens to thieves. And they let it come into their heart. They began to be terrified. The Bible says it's your treasure. Moving on quickly now. I'll stay with the final part of Isaac. Genesis 27. Turn with me to Genesis 27. Let's look at the blessing scandal. Now it came to pass, the Bible says in verse 1, when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see, and that he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, and he answered him, Guess what? I mean me. Here I am. Genesis 27, 18 to 23. So he went to his father and said, My father, here I am. He said, Who are you, my son? What's happening here? If you already know, Isaac is old. His eyes are growing dim, church, and he wants to give a blessing to his son. So he calls his old son, his favorite son. His favorite son is Esau. Why is his son? Why is Esau's favorite son? Because Esau is a tough guy. He is. He's a tough guy. He's an old roughneck of a man. He's he's without a doubt. I'm just gonna be. I'm gonna go ahead and say it. Don't get mad at me, but he's a redneck, y'all. He's a Marlboro man. He goes out in the woods. He's a hunter. He's one of those tough guys that just doesn't care about anything. In fact, the Bible says one day he goes on a hunting trip and he doesn't quite get what he's looking for because he's so hungry. And he ends up running back to the house saying, if I don't get something to eat right now, I'm going to die. And he ends up selling his birthright for a bowl of lentil stew. I would have done it for fajitas, but lentil stew. There we have it. This is a guy who is quickly, quickly, he's very, very, um, well, find out a little bit about uh, Esau here. So Esau is wanting to get blessed, and of course Jacob's wanting to bless him, uh, and, and or excuse me, Isaac's wanting to bless him, and he says, I want you to go and get yourself a deer, son, and I want you to make him savory the way I like them. And of course, uh, Isaac goes out quickly to go deer hunting, and this is a time and day and age where they don't have deer stands, they don't have deer corn, they don't have scents and scratches to put on the barks and the trees, so he actually has to get a deer, run it up against a wall, a cliff, or somewhere where the deer can't run, and be able to shoot it with his bow and arrow or stab it with his spear. So it takes some skill, and it took some time to do that. And so uh, what happens, though, is the mama overhears this conversation. That's right, Rebecca overhears it, and she goes to her favorite son, which is Jacob, and says, I want you to be the one that gets blessed, and so you need to go and bring a kid, uh, a goat, a young goat from, from our flocks, and I will make food the way your father loves it. Isn't it amazing how mamas know exactly what daddies want? Amen? She knew how to get to his heart. And church, the Bible says that's what happens. She takes some of the skins from the goat, puts it on Jacob's arms, she puts some of Esau's clothes on him because she knew that Esau had that smell or the feel of being outside on his clothes. And of course, Jacob is worried about it. He's saying he's going to hear my voice. He's going to know that I'm trying to deceive him, and he's going to curse me. And of course, the mother uh, consoles her son by saying, let his curse come upon me. And so now we're in verse 18 here. So he went to his father and said, my father, he said, Hanini, who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I've done just as you told me. Please arise, sit, and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how is it you found it so quickly? Of course, you know why he said that, because he's expecting them to be gone a, a, a couple of days at least. But how many of you know that the moment Jacob leaves this tent, the tent flap is still moving, in comes Isaac, it says, excuse me, in comes Esau, who says, hey, guess what? I got a deer too. Which tells me he went to a neighbor and said, can I borrow a steak? Because that took some time to get those things. How is it you found it so quickly? Jacob lies and says, because the Lord your God brought it to me. Verse 21, Isaac said to Jacob, please come near that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son or Esau or not, because he's got some doubts now. The reason why he's got doubts is, number one, it should have taken a lot longer time to kill, dress, and get a deer ready. Two, he's not hearing Esau's voice. He's hearing Jacob's voice. Three, he knows Isaac's manner. 
Isaac's a rough, tough guy. When he walks in the room, there's no doubt who it is. You ever know a guy like that? When he walks in the room, you can feel his presence, can't you? You know those people. Some of you got sons like that. You know, whoa, my son walks in the room. The whole world knows it. Esau was one of those guys. Jacob walked into the room. He had to say hello for anybody to even notice he was there. Esau walks in, excuse me, Jacob walks in and he says, my father. And he's like, who is that? Well, I'm your son Esau. And he's like, my son Esau does not have a little pitch squeak voice. He would say, hey, dad, guess what? I got a steak for you, bro. And I made it the way you like it with jalapenos, habaneros, and five gallons of hot sauce. Of course, I did. Whoa, come here. I can feel you. Verse 22, Jacob went near to his Isaac, his father. He felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice. But the hands and the hands of Esau, he felt the skins of the dead. Verse 23, he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. This is where we can learn our best part this morning from Isaac. Isaac was lost. All those wonderful traits he talked about in him. That loyalty. That faith that said, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Somewhere down the line, Isaac kind of put that on the shelf. He forgot that real faith never comes by what you see. It comes by what you hear, doesn't it? The Bible tells us that. Isaac had lost that. He wasn't worried about whether or not he saw a lamb. He worried about what he heard. He wasn't worried about whether or not Rebecca was talking to God. He worried about what he heard. Isaac lost that. He hears Jacob's voice, but he wants to see Esau. Even though his eyes are gone, he tries to see him through a sense that he already lost. He says, come here. I want to feel you so I can see you through my hands. Bible says he feels this cause. I want to see you with the sense of my smell. I want to smell you. Every time I read this verse, I'm overcome for the very first Christmas I was gone from my family. So I lived in Brownwood at the seminary. My family moved to Kentucky. Christmas time came and it was my first Christmas away. My family loved us in us a box of Christmas sweets. And I remember even though I opened up the box and everything inside was wrapped for Christmas, you know, don't open till Christmas. But the smell of my family came out. So I was overwhelmed with that smell. And I can understand how Isaac reached down to smell his son. He was overwhelmed at the smell of his son Esau. That's my son. That's the one I love. That's the one I've been dreaming of. And the smell makes it so much more alive in my mind's eye. I can see him with the sense of my smell. The church, the Bible tells us to ignore what he heard. It used to be the other way around. He would ignore what he saw. He would ignore what was apart from him. He would only believe what he heard. But today, he's ignoring what he hears. What did he hear? He heard the voice of Jacob. He wanted to believe it was Esau. Some of you have been sitting in the pew saying, God's talking to me. And you've been sitting there saying for years, show me something, God. I want you to know faith never comes by what you see. Faith always comes by what you hear. Let's look at our last picture of the day here. We have a picture of Jacob stealing the blessing. Perhaps that's old Isaac. Perhaps that's actually the way he looked. Got those, I don't know how they got the skins on his hand to look like gloves, but there they did. They stuck it up there. Who's that person in the back? We don't know. I like to think of him as the devil. There he is, and feel that blessing. And he fools his father. As I've said before, faith never ever comes by sight. Faith comes by hearing. Look with me in Romans chapter 10. The last scripture of the day. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. The Bible tells us, So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Once I had a young lady call me. She 
said, I've been asking about this verse for years. Then I realized I have a brother-in-law who's a preacher. What does this verse mean? I said, well, who's the Word of God? He said, duh, that's Jesus. I said, so that tells you that you can't even begin to have faith until you believe in Jesus. That the Word of God means nothing to you until you accept Jesus Christ. You might be sitting there in the pew this morning and say, Pastor, I've been reading the Bible over and over and over and over and over again, and it means nothing to me. It's a bunch of jumbled stuff. I don't really understand it. That's because you can't hear what the Word has to say until you understand who the Word is. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. When you start to believe that Jesus is the living Word, when you start to understand that it's His Word, that it's 100% inerrant, it's 100% inspired, that it's 100% infallible, then you'll start having faith in what it says instead of what you see. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And as we look at Isaac that morning, he'd forgotten that spiritual truth. He'd forgotten that real faith never comes by what you see. It always comes by what you hear. And he heard Jacob's voice, and he overlooked that part of the problem. He let that go. And he trusted what he could see. And you might be saying there this morning, I'm not doing anything until God does something for me. Well, I want you to know that there is one time God did something. I want you to know that God not only did something for you, but He showed you. He showed it for you. For you. You. Yes, you. He did it for you. Your name. You. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that God demonstrated His love for us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is the one time God said, I want to show you how much I love you. I want to show you what you mean to me. I want to show you that you're worth my only begotten Son. And Christ died for us even while we were yet sinners, even while we couldn't hear the Word of God, even while we were saying, I want to smell it. I want to touch it. I want to feel it. I don't want to hear it. I want to see something. God died for us, and He died for you, and He gave His only begotten Son for you. Why? Because He loved you. Faith never comes by what you see. It always comes by what you hear. Perhaps you're hearing this morning. a Christian if you're not living like a Christian. Perhaps you hear that still, small voice that says, Robertson Avenue is your home. You need to come home and tell us about it. Perhaps God's calling you to something else. Did you surrender to His voice today? Not what you see. Because if you were looking today, you'd see Buccaneer Bay behind you. I want you to hear what God has to say. And what is God saying? God is saying, come. Today is the day of salvation. Now this is the time. We're going to close in a word of prayer. And if you've spoken to you, would you not overlook his voice as he comes to you? Father, we come to you now in Jesus' name. We want to thank you for your word. And I pray even now in Jesus' holy and righteous name, you just pause this time. And if there be anyone that needs to come to know you as personal Lord and Savior, if there anyone, Father God, that needs to get their heart right with you in any way, would you let now be the time? Would you let today be that day? You come as we sing song. Have thine own way. Would you come this morning? Would you come?
I have two of my digits to come forward with you. Okay. Okay. This is my prayer. Every one of you grab a man to suck in. Jack, as you come in. At this time, would you go ahead and put that in your hand? If you have your Bibles with you and you'd like to read with me, would you come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11? The Bible says in verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, and this cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Brother John, would you take us to the Lord in prayer? Says, for I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. What he had given thanks, as Brother John just read, he broke it and said, Take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. same manner also he took the cup and he sucked saying this cup is the new testament in my blood. This do ye as often you drink it in remembrance of me. Now God's good with that. Amen. Praise the Lord. It has been my tradition throughout my 27 years of ministry to conclude every Lord's Supper service with the singing of the hymn. I do that because the Bible tells us in the Gospels that as Jesus and his disciples left the upper room that night after the Last Supper and sang him. It's been my pleasure and it's been my privilege to lead this every church and lead this every church by the singing of my favorite Lord's Supper hymn, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. And I'm going to ask Brother Robert, would you come and lead us in that hymn? Let it be our closing prayer and let it be our closing hymn. Brother Robert. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible.